Join me every month for the inspiration to find your finish line. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Find Your Finish Line, presented by ActiveIce, the official topical pain relief partner of Ironman. I'm Mike Riley, your host, and it's not only about being able to find your finish line at a race or an event, but in life. I'll have successful people on from all walks of life who have overcome the struggles of getting to the finish line, and hopefully their stories will inspire yours. Well, guess what? I've got that type of guest on today. His name is Roderick Sewell. He's 28 years old. He is the first bilateral above the knee amputee to finish the Ironman World Championship in Kona. Hello, Roderick. Hey, Mike. Thank you for having me. Oh, my pleasure. It's good to see you. I said that uh, back in Ironman, Arizona, we were there together in 2019, sitting at the bar, having a little drink. And that's the last time we saw one another. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I, I appreciate you talking with me. Um, we spoke a lot about your book and, uh, you know, just having that information kind of helped me navigate what I want to do. Um, so I am currently working on a book at the moment. I know. I'm, I want to talk about that a little later. That is fantastic to hear. And when you told me that, that you were going to be writing a book. I just, I, I, that is perfect. Um, I, I can't wait to read it. Well, finishing Kona on two prosthetic legs, I'm going to go back and start at the beginning. It's funny. I read something that you had said or written down, said no legs, no problem. And it seems like that's the attitude that you've always had. Uh, but before we start, I want to say, make sure you say hi to your mom, Miriam, for me. How's she doing? <laughs> She is doing well. I will let her know. She, uh, I told her I was talking to you today, so she did say hello. All right. Fantastic. For well, sure. mom made the decision at a very young age, before you were eight years old, against a lot of family members' wish to amputate your legs because you were missing tibias in both of your legs. And at, at the age that that happened uh, to you, do you recollect much about that at all? You know, it was so much going on that a lot of things I didn't really process until I got older. You know, just um, for me, when I was going through that, it was, why are we going through this? Uh, and then it was later on that I learned my mom was making a decent income, um, but not enough to afford my prosthetics. So the best way that she could work the system was get, you know, quit her job, get full coverage for my prosthetics, durable medical equipment so that I could walk. And um, that gave me the prosthetics I needed to move around, which, you know, domino effect. We lost our car. We lost our house. Um, and these were the sacrifices she made so that I can be mobile and, and live a quote unquote normal life. Um, but yeah, yeah. There's so many parents out there that obviously sacrifice for their children. But your mom's story is is almost above and be it is above and beyond. Because all of a sudden, you from ages eight through 12 years old found yourself with your mom in and out of shelters in San Diego, uh, moving around a lot. You know, you didn't have what you had before. Uh, what do you remember about that time? Did, did she kept it really happy and upbeat because she got you into sports? Uh, how's that time uh, recollect with you? It was, um, you know, we were going through our, the worst of the worst. Um, and at that time we were each other's, um, scapegoat. You know, I, I looked at my mom, she was always cracking jokes and still being lively, um, even in the worst conditions. And she had already been through, you know, by this time, my mom close to 40. Um, so she had already been through her own trials and tribulations, being born in Florida, moving to California, working for the Navy. Um, so for her, this was just another, another, part of her chapter for me it was a part of life you know I, I grew up I was born pretty much and walking on prosthetics to me you know I didn't walk any other way I don't I don't know any other way of life um and then once we became homeless you know I relied on her she relied on me to to kind of lift her spirits up um and during that time we got involved with Challenge Athletes Foundation which getting involved with them and and learning about adaptive sports and learning that I had a community that I didn't even know I had. Um, that was enough to kind of be our, our light, our spark in a, a very dark time. Um, 
And it is a beautiful community with Challenge Athlete Foundation leading the way. And we'll talk about that. What about, Roderick, what about the, you know, kids can be cruel and peers can be your friends, but yet they can, they can make fun. What about, what about the, the, the kids around you? How, how'd they react to you being on prosthetics? I, what was that like for you? The one thing I noticed, and again, this is something I didn't realize until I was older, the kids that were, that were exposed to amputees or individuals with disabilities, the children who grew up and saw that, I, to them, I was just another person. You know, they, that's where I found some of my good friends and people that had already seen what I was going through. Um, now you have the other side of children who are curious, who don't know, who are only going to associate it with what they know. And that's the robot. You know, they see these prosthetic mm-hmm. legs and immediately it's like, oh my God, you're a machine. <laughs> what, are, what are you? Um, and that was rough because as a kid, for me, you know, I didn't know any other way. I didn't know what was different or weird about me because that was just the way I lived. Um, so it had to, it was kind of two pronged. I had to be comfortable and learn that I was different um, as well as understanding that this same difference is not seen on a daily basis, like for these children. For me, I, I, I could walk past the mirror and I'm just normal, you know, <laughs> but for these kids, you know, they, they've never seen prosthetics. They've never seen, an amputee they've never seen anybody maneuvering like this and as a child i didn't realize that they're just uneducated they're just unaware now i can take upon that time to be like okay these are prosthetics i use these to walk just like you see somebody in a wheelchair you see someone with crutches these are my these are my support um and having that now i wish obviously it's just hard for a kid to have that you know as a child you're just so caught up in everything else that a child's caught up on so how old were you when all of a sudden you realized, you know what, I am different, but it's okay, and I'm good with it, and you kind of moved forward from there? How old were you when, when you think that happened? I think I would say around five or six, um, only because I, I had a moment where I, first, I got my first pair of new, quote-unquote, adult prosthetics. Um, I had been walking on baby prosthetics for a while, and the new ones put me at a certain height, um, <laughs> certain, like, they were colorful. You know, and just for me, it was weird. You know, it was very different from what I was used to. Uh, and my mom stood me in front of a mirror just to see everything, full on prosthetics and just accept it, you know. And I remember I was crying. I was bawling because I was uncomfortable. I was upset that I had to wear them. I was tired. I just wanted to go back to the way things were where I can throw my legs off and run around, you know. Yeah. And I, I looked at my mom and I remember seeing tears in her eyes. but. Um, they didn't drop. And it was also, she had this kind of stern look of, you know, you have to, you have to figure this out. You have to get this for yourself. Um, I can only help you so much. I can only take you so far, but there's going to be a point where it's up to you. And this is one of those moments. Um, And I remember looking at myself and wiping away my tears and eventually just kind of calming down. And um, from there on, I practiced, 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 practiced walking in my prosthetics. Um, yeah, and then I have a very interesting first day of school photo. My mom wanted everybody to see my legs and how cool they were. Yeah, she gave me the, the shortest shorts possible to go to school on my first <laughs> day. Just uh, it's the funniest photo. I think it was like either uh, kindergarten or first grade. I can't remember. Um, but super just preppy, you know. <laughs> so were the were the shorts were they a, a sh- uh, above to where the top of the prosthetics were? Did they show? No. Their- no, no, they were uh, like right. They were like above the knee, um, but far to like mid thigh. You know, <laughs> so she wanted them to see like the the socket, the knees, the feet. And I'm just like, what? What's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, remember, it was all in love. You know that. But at what? the time, you're probably going, "What the heck, mom? You're right. killing me here." <laughs> I don't care. If people see my my legs. I just want to walk and wear normal shorts. <laughs> Let's talk about your relationship with the Challenge Athlete Foundation and your relationship with Rudy Garcia Tolson. Uh, he was the first double knee amputee. He finished Ironman uh, Arizona, one of the amputees to finish Arizona. And uh, you and Rudy have this bond, as you do with Bob Babbitt and the whole Challenge Athlete Foundation, the organization that is just just wonderful. But when you, like you said earlier, 
when you felt like you were being accepted because now you were in a family, you were in a community that was really like you. How did the things that Rudy was doing uh, inspire you to do the things you've done and obviously finish an Ironman and, and compete in the Paralympics? It's, um, you know, seeing that and seeing Rudy and meeting everyone at CAF, it, um, it, it's one of those situations where you're quick to see yourself in an individual and vice versa you know it was just immediately for us it was um instant like we we met when we were young and i was just like man i i kind of already know what you've gone through in more ways than one um mm -hmm. i feel like we've we've lived different variations of the same life but in and obviously walking in different shoes you know we we still have our own trials and tribulations and because of the way we met um, I think our hearts are so focused on making sure that this next generation gets that same feeling. You know, um, we, CAF has really turned into just like a community, like a, a reunion of, of family members and is, is constantly growing. Um, we're going on our 28th year now for our triathlon challenge in San Diego, um, raise millions for individuals with disabilities worldwide. And it's, it's only going to keep going. You know, we, we have this company, this organization that is willing to ask the world for help to get individuals the equipment they need to live a healthy and active lifestyle because these insurance companies aren't going to do it for them. And we know as triathletes, we know being active is a huge part of our life. So why take that away from somebody else? Um, it is. It's it, it, it's a beautiful organization with what they've done over the 28 years. And I was there at the very first event and so many of them. Uh, and it is the most inspiring day in the sport of triathlon uh, to see what we see and, and what people overcome and get to. And, and you've been one of them. So that is fantastic. And you, you go from that and you, you go to, all of a sudden you go, I'm going to, I'm going to do an Ironman. First of all, did you really think, I mean, when was it when you made the decision? All right. I got to doggone it. Rudy did it. I got to, I got to try to finish. <laughs> I got, I got to try to finish Kona. Was it, was it a self pressure thing or people were pushing you into, or you really truly made that decision 100% on your own? It was definitely a hundred percent. You know, I got to a point in my life where any challenge that was presented in front of me, never <laughs> to like stray from it, just, face it head on. And when I had said that is around the time where I um, went with Rudy and Bob to Oceanside. And that was April of 2019. We did the half there. I did everything but the bike. I had my teammate do the bike course. And um, Francer, I believe this is his last name. Uh, he, after he did the bike, I did the run. I, before that run, I didn't run more than six miles. Um, <laughs> And I did 13 miles in an hour and 39 minutes. Uh, I I think my endurance from swimming really carried me a lot of a lot of the ways. Mm -hmm. um, but that sparked the interest. And the, in my mind, at first, I was like, "Oh, marathon running. That's going to be where my my focus is." It wasn't necessarily Ironman or triathlon. Um, I thought, "Okay, I'm 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 transitioning from the sprinter swimmer to this endurance athlete. Which way would I go? Would it be triathlon? Would it be marathon?" Um, and I just kept training everything. I didn't have a bike. I didn't really ride. So I really just swam and ran. And I remember getting the, the slot from Ironman and, and, uh, and I think it was July. This is July, 2019. Um, and three months away from Kona and, and just getting that offer. I'm like, you're in front of all these people. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> would blame you if you said no. Nobody would blame you if you failed. Like it was, it's, it's tough. It's a, it's a challenge. Um, it's just kind of part of the territory, you know, you either win or you lose, you're up or you're down. Um, and once that presented itself to me, I was like everything, whenever I noticed that a challenge is in my face, it also, you know, like you said, it, it allows room for that red carpet to, to roll out. Um, if you take it on and, and take those precautions, you could have a, you can set yourself up for a, a beautiful chapter in your life. Well, that was a beautiful chapter and a beautiful finish, 16 hours and 29 minutes and making that call of bringing you in. I was down on the, uh, at the finish line and standing next to mom and, and to see 
I, I wish I, I wish I could have captured on video the look in your mom's face when you were coming. I think I said something like, you know, Rudy's coming. And right away she looked at me. I knew he was going to do it. You know, like, okay, mom. Yeah, I understand. You know, you know, you don't mess with Marion. And, uh, uh, when you came across it, it had to be, you know, good morning. America had you on and said, you made history in Kona and you did, uh, did the weight of all that right there at that finish line kind of hit you or was it a little later Take us through that process of coming across that finish line. It was it was definitely a gradual feel. You know, you don't get it all at once. Yeah. There's just so much going on. Um, coming into the finish line, I will say, like, I didn't think it was real. <laughs> just racing all day. And once you see it, it's like, wait, this is over? This is almost done? Okay. Um, this is finished. We did it. <laughs> uh, coming in, you know, I didn't even think to celebrate at the finish line i didn't even think all i thought was cross it because you are struggling right now and i do not know how much time i have left um coming in i I saw everyone i didn't even think about the race anymore once i crossed the line it was just we did it you know we we green check confirmed um seeing everybody there just this huge team effort uh as and that's exactly what it was there's no way i could have did this by myself um but i knew that because I wasn't alone, um, just as a team and in general. Like I knew how many people from CAF were watching. I knew how many kids were watching. I knew how many triathletes and, and just athletes worldwide that were watching. Um, and I knew that if, if there were people that weren't watching and they needed just proof that anything truly is possible, um, this this moment sealed it. You know, it, it allows that space. It, it, uh, it gives people a chance to say. Um, if anything is a, if anything truly is possible, then I need to leave room for the impossible. Yeah, it, it, it was a, it was a beautiful finish and, and congratulations again when you came across. But so many athletes, pros and age groupers, don't feel bad about it. They finish and they go, "Gosh, I I didn't even know who's at the finish." And then I went over here and I did this. I wonder I should have enjoyed it more. And and I say, "Well, you were out there for 16 hours. Either you enjoyed it or didn't <laughs> enjoy it. You know, <laughs> don't always worry about what happens at the finish line." So you you talk a lot. Roderick, obviously about family and mom and, and your Ironman family, your Ohana, but you always talk a lot about your ancestry and, and, uh, the strength that has given you, why is that so important to you? You know, the main question that was given to me, um, before Kona was what's your why? And, you know, three months before Kona, I don't have a bike. Uh, <laughs> luckily I work, I work with CAF to get a hand cycle a near my first Mueller hand cycle. Um, and in the midst of training, I'm just like, I, I need, it was one of those situations where I needed motivation. I needed something to rely on to get me across. Um, and it's interesting when you look back in history and learn the capability of man or what man is capable of, um, not necessarily always the negative, but the positive, like the, the strength and the capabilities and, and tapping into that inside of you. Um, the more digging I did and my ancestry and just learning about you know, my history, um, I'm inspired, you know, I'm inspired to know that, okay, I, you know, anything is possible. You're capable of doing crazy things, whether it's alone or as a group. Um, and just knowing that kind of supplied me with what I needed. It, it gave me enough to realize that, okay, now it's my turn. It's my turn to tap into whatever I need to tap into and know that internally I have everything I need to get across the finish line. And I think that's the part that um, needs to be focused on because a lot of people would rather, uh, oh, you know, he doesn't have legs and he did the Ironman. He could have did the push rim and got across so much faster. Um, you know, it's, it's the challenge and accepting and knowing that, you know, you have what it takes. Um, mm-hmm. it's not necessarily how you're going to do it because the Ironman is hard for whoever it is. It doesn't matter how you're doing it. Um, but the will that you have to continue, I think that's, that needs to be acknowledged the most. That's everything. And, and, uh, yeah, it's an Ironman. It's hard. 
it's always going to be hard, no matter who you are, whether you you or or Jan Ferdino. It, it it's hard out there. But I think you're right that the spirit within you, who is is usually it's bred from your ancestors and the ones that have gone before you and and gone through some some tough times to to help you get where you are today. I think everybody needs to uh, investigate that and make sure they they keep that at the forefront. Hold on, everyone. We'll be right back after a message from our sponsors. As an endurance athlete, you're constantly pushing your body to new limits, searching for your personal best for the next finish line. If you're training for an endurance event, whether it's short distance or long distance, proper recovery is the key to you unlocking your potential. As the official topical pain relief partner for the Ironman US series, Activice's lineup of topical cooling gel Roll on and spray features 8% menthol and eucalyptus oil to provide the instant icy relief you need to recover smarter and faster. The water based, non sticky formula withstands sweat to keep up with the demands and exertion of race day. Don't let muscle pain or sprains hold you back from reaching your potential, from reaching your personal best. Shop the Activices lineup on Amazon today for the support you need to find your finish line. You competed in the Paralympic trials, right? I did. I went to the trials in 2012, 2016, and then we just had our Paralympic trials here in Minneapolis, 2021. Now, you're not, explain to everybody out there, you're not uh, with the Paralympic team that's going to Tokyo because you're not classified in swimming and cycling. What's that all about? So with the Paralympics, you have to be classified internationally to even be able to qualify for the Paralympics. Um, we have national classifications and international classifications. And these classifications, these categories that you're placed in are based off of and um, just a, uh, what's the term, medical term I'm looking for, um, evaluation of mm-hmm. your, your disability. So based off your disability, they're trying to keep everybody in an equal um, competing category. Uh, but with that being said, you know, COVID put a lot of wrenches in a, a lot of plans, but it made it kind of more difficult to get classified. Um, a lot of people were, were trying their best to get classified. We had Rudy who went to Brazil to get classified in swimming. Um, I went to Belgium to get classified in, in cycling. And uh, I found out the week before that they weren't going to classify any USA athletes except for one. Um, <laughs> So it, it, it was a, a true attempt, but, you know, it, it is what it is. I, I can still train. And for me, I kind of find comfort in knowing that I'm strong now. And these guys, they're, I'm cheering them on as they head to Tokyo. You know, we, we're going to get the most coverage we've ever had of the Paralympic Games. And personally, I'm biased. I would rather tune into the Paralympics than the Olympics. Um, but, you know, we're already in the next quad. You know, 2024 is going to be in Paris. 2021 is almost over now, which is crazy. Um, so with that being said, I'm in a good position now for my, my, my teammates and my competition to come home, get comfortable, relax after their game. And then I'm still going to be in a point where next year I'm already in, the, in a good position. So, so what you're saying, what you're saying is go compete. Good luck. You come home. I'm still here. And I want to kick some butt and I'm going to be ready for you. Is that what, that's what you're saying, isn't it? I'll, I'll be here ready. <laughs> you're too, Roderick, you're too nice of a guy. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've all had, you know, high points and low points of our life. You've talked to us about some of your low points, but what do you think was probably the biggest lesson you learned when, you know, you kind of got smacked around a little bit? Um. You learn a lot about yourself, really. Um, you know, you learn, uh, obviously, is that character building. Um, but it's, it's, it can be kind of worrisome, you know, because you're like, oh, you want to know, you want to be a certain individual until that test comes around. Then you're wondering what kind of individual will you be? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but... I I loved the movie. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. It was Morgan Freeman had played God, and it was a sequel where he talked about are are we 
when you pray to God, do you pray for patience or are you given opportunity to be patient? And that's where I'm, I'm kind of in a position now. Um, do I, like I said, like, do I pray for challenges and expect myself to be ready? Or do I accept these challenges that come around and put myself through them to, to be that person on the other side? You know, because uh, everything else in between is, is the journey. It's, it's who you become in the end, I think, is the benefit. Right. Are, are you still a vegan? I I was I <laughs> I never classified as a vegan. Oh I wait was, a minute! I heard yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> I, that was where you know I think there's a, a huge miscommunication. Um, so I partnered with Vega, um, right? And they are primarily vegan. And I told them that I trained on a vegetarian vegan diet leading into Kona. Um, and the main reason why I did it is for inflammation. I knew I was just going to put a huge load on my body and I needed mm-hmm. food to help me recover, help me build. Um, and that was the fastest thing I could think of was change my diet, fruits, veggies, whatever I need. Um, and honestly, I started cooking a lot more and it's just easier to cook veggies. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I, but I wouldn't like vegans would come after me if I said I was vegan and vegetarians might do. So I, I wouldn't say that I'm a vegan or vegetarian, but I've definitely gravitated more towards a, a plant-based diet um, well before six months before Kona. And then ever since. Well, you kept that safe. Good for you because you don't want anybody coming after you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, I couldn't, I couldn't say that with, uh, with truth. <laughs> is there, is there, I, I know that your, your Paralympic, goals and aspirations you think you ever do an iron man again i would love to i have my i told you earlier i just got my carbon bike um right you know, i only had three months to train for the the cycling portion of the iron man um so i would love to try again and see if i can go faster personally if i could do more iron man competitions worldwide and just help bring more exposure about caf um mm-hmm. and and honestly it's ever there was a time i feel like especially after 2020 we we've been open and aware to the atrocities done to individuals and um i don't know if it's because i grew up being a a black man in america i grew up being a disabled individual in america that i just naturally gravitate 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 towards people that are oppressed in any way shape or form you know and I think this would be the perfect time to kind of raise that voice and, and under make it more of a movement. And I think the whole time I've been involved with CAF, that's always been our, our goal, race for movement, race for reason. And if I could do that and bring some awareness, that would be, that would make doing an Ironman even more fulfilling. Yeah. But the, and the reason obviously is always to get to that finish line. But like you said earlier, it's the journey where you end up teaching others of what it is and it takes and the work and the effort to, to overcome and to get to the finish line. So uh, I commend you for that. And I think I, I agree with you. I think the timing is right. I mean, if you go to a race in New Zealand or, or Frankfurt or Finland or wherever it may be, uh, the exposure that you would bring to that area and to the people who uh, need that exposure, I think would be great. So I hope that I really hope that happens. So that's uh, good for you. Good for you. And, it's one what those, a, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say it's, it's one of those situations where I definitely had to learn um, because we all want to we all want to get to that finish line. Um, and I I personally had to learn that, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Um, so it's definitely a collective effort to get all of us to the finish line. And it's, it's doable. That, that, I, I've never heard you want to go fast go alone. You want to go far, go with others. Good for you. I may, I may steal that. I I want to say that's a, uh, yeah, that better be in your book. (laughs) I think it's a, like a Marine quote or like a old proverb. I can't remember. Uh, Probably. So, so talk to us about your project of the, of the book. Uh, I remember us, yes, having that conversation and trying to give you, you know, when you do something for the very first time in your life and you want to navigate, there's always, 
you know, especially in the business side of the world, there's decisions you make and go, oh my gosh, was that the right decision and the whole deal. So how is the process going on writing the book? You know, it's been really nice. Uh, I got involved with a writing group. I, um, I've been working on who I'm going to pitch to. We have a, a possible, um, you know, I won't, I won't say too much, but right. uh, I have an interview coming late uh, after Labor Day. And um, yeah, I want to have my book proposal ready. I've been writing a lot more. I have a plan on where I would uh, bring my material and just have more people listen and, and possibly invest. Um, it's been an interesting project. It's been it's been very uh, healing at the same time as rewarding, you know. Um, so that's where I'm at now, still writing. Uh, I have an agent who's working with me to get the book out there, um, as well as I'm looking for work at the moment while training as well. Uh, I, I'm living in Colorado Springs. I've been reaching out to local um, prosthetists and orthodontists. Uh, they are there's a few individuals who are looking for um, community outreach. And I think if I can be just like with CAF being that person to me to introduce me to that world of resources, if I can be that individual to meet people who are newly amputees or don't know what they have access to or don't know what they should be doing to be active and live a healthy lifestyle as an amputee, um, if I can be that, that first kind of like introduction before, um, you know, somebody loses a limb and then falls into depression or, mm -hmm. or loses a limb and, and thinks that the world is over. They don't have anything available for them. Um, I, you know, the, any kind of work that doesn't feel like work to me is something that I gravitate towards. So this is something that it just hits home a little differently. Um, and it would never, I would never get tired of it. Just like I would never get tired of working with CAF and, and seeing the look on faces that um, get their first running blade or get their first bike right. and, and take off from there. You know, they, I, CAF did that for me and, and I'm just trying to be that next inspiration for, for the next individual. Well, if anybody's out there listening to the podcast and you're in the Colorado Springs area, get a hold of Roderick. I want you to call him up and, and get him some work. Uh, have you worked much with, with, uh, the, the military men and women that have lost their limbs in, in combat and battle and, Obviously, they're battling PTSD and th that whole. Have you worked much with the military? I have, not necessarily, you know, on the mental health side, but as we know, the the physical just being active can be such a, a relief for the mental health for the physical health. Um, I've definitely worked with individuals who come back and lost a limb on just maneuvering and working with their prosthetic. Um, I've worked with them in the water as well. That's probably where I've done the most work is uh, just getting them comfortable with being in the water again. Um, and seeing their faces and, and realizing like, just, you know, just personally for me, like, wow, this individual like served our country. They're, they're fighting for our freedom, you know, and they, they made the ultimate sacrifice. And now I'm helping them bounce back and get back into the world. And even if it's a little bit, you know, even if, even if it's just to have somebody to call that lives a, a similar life and you have questions, um, being that for, for a soldier that, you know, fights for us is pretty nice. Yeah. It's nicer to get back, you know. And and Rudy, you're a good man. I mean, you know, paying it forward is is what it's all about. And uh others will move forward because of, of your story. Who's your yeah, I, I know you could say your mom, but yeah, who's your hero out there? Who what person do you look up to and I wonder what he would do? I wonder what she would do. Uh who is that if you'd like to share that with us? It's funny. You, you called me his name, actually. You called me Rudy. <laughs> <laughs> I did call you Rudy once. Didn't I? After, I, after I said it, I go, I think I just called Roderick Rudy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's perfect. It's a perfect setup. Uh, no, because he, he, he was, the, he was the, the first, you know, he kind of started the, um, just the trend, just the, the chain of, the chain reaction of, I see this individual, I see them overcoming. How do I associate that with myself? Um, and, you know, I don't have any, I wouldn't, I don't have any superstars, you know, that are um, just huge motivators to myself. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, I've, I've done a lot more work to look more inwardly for those answers and that, that vision. Like if there's somebody that would motivate me, who would they look like or what would they look like? Okay. If I have that vision, what do I need to do or become to be that person? You know, what internal work do I need to make? to be this individual um and 
like you said, you know, you, you can look at the greats, you can model from the greats. Um, and, you know, Rudy, Bob, these individuals have been people that I've looked at, but have also offered more to me than just um, motivation. You know, they've been there for questions and, and uh, Bob Abbott, you know, Hall of Famer now. And <laughs> he's, he's been, you know, just a, a huge force in helping us be the individuals that we are today. Um, so, yeah, anybody that's at a caliber that's so great, but yet still looks out for the individuals that are on their way up. Um, they're really the ones that I admire the most. Yeah. And you got that, but you got to watch out for those hall of famers, you know, but, <laughs> but uh, uh, what I like about that too, uh, uh, Roderick is, is uh, you wanting to mold yourself at the things that person's doing. Cause so many people out there have these, heroes and they say, I want to be like him. I want to be like her. I want to, but they don't take it internally to try to figure out the things that those people are doing so they can do it themselves. Uh, that's, you know, Hey, the final question always on find your finish line. I call it, uh, uh, tri table racing because I've got good friends that race the Baja 1000, the, the long 1000 mile race through the Baja of California and the racers down there call it table racing. They sit around the table after words and reminisce about the race, that one or a past race or a memory of it. So, uh, what kind of memory can you give me of any event you were in, uh, that kind of sticks with you and reminisce with us about that, uh, about that memory? Um, <laughs> Uh, let me think. Let me think. You can pick anyone, and it's good or bad. Because it's it's sad on my part. You know, I feel like I can't really call myself a triathlete because well, you, my, you are. Hey, you, wait, 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 wait. You are a triathlete, okay? <laughs> I well, you know, my first full half Ironman was done two weeks before Kona. <laughs> um, every triathlon I've done has been with a teammate. You know, I haven't done a full except for two weeks before Kona and then actual Kona. Um, so if I have to say. My my first half Ironman was in Montauk, and doing that race had me so terrified because I was so sore and beat, and I was just like, I have to do double this distance in two weeks, <laughs> and I don't see this happening right now. Um, so that stood out to me because I was, uh, you know, getting a little nervous, but the whole point of going there was getting the race jitters out. Um, so I didn't let it sink in. I just kept in mind that it's going to be double. I know to take it a little slower and know that, um, you know, the, everything I, like I said earlier, everything's internal. Um, so going into Kona, I think one of the highlights for me, um, one of the best highlights, I wouldn't even say the, honestly, it might be because I'm biased. I would say the swim. Um, obviously we went off in waves, the physically challenged category went off third after the pro men and the pro women. And most of the people in the physically challenged category are either cyclists or runners. You know, we don't have too many strong swimmers. I'm probably the, I was probably the strongest swimmer out there. Um, so we start to swim and I'm alone. You know, I'm out there by myself. The pros are way ahead and I'm pretty much ahead of my group. Um, but it was such a zen moment of just like everything was slowed down. The wind was actually picking up and, Mm -hmm. causing a bit of a bit of a current but as well yeah but uh, my mind was just so quiet and clear and i think having that moment of because you know it, it could be mayhem <laughs> it could be like you and a group of people uh swimming and uh we did the swim i think it was a few days before kona the, just to test out the course and that was like wow this is a lot you know this is a lot of feet in my face and a lot of splashing but to just have it so calm uh, during the race really set me up for a positive bike and a positive run. Wow, that I, I didn't know that. So you had, thinking about it, as you said that, Roderick, you, you had your own water during Ironman Day. Nobody gets their own water. The men <laughs> pros are up there beating each other up. The female pros are beating each other up. And all of a sudden you find yourself, I, I love the analogy, the Zen moment. I can imagine that because I've swum out there, uh, you know, non Ironman time when it's just all by yourself. And, and that had to be a moment that just catapulted you through the rest of the day. It's, it's super, just, it's very surreal. It's very um, calming, very warm. And yeah, yeah. It really, it really did set up just for like, okay, this is going to be good. It's going to be a good day. I did catch one pro woman. 
I don't know who she was, but I did catch her. <laughs> <laughs> well, good for you. Good for you. <laughs> well, Roderick Sewell, it's been uh, an honor having you on Find Your Finish Line. Thank you very much. We're going to be following you and watching you and see what's what's in your future. Where can where can someone follow you? Or how, how can they find you? For sure. If you'd like to follow me on Instagram or Twitter, my name is R Sewell, R S E W E L L 92. Um, and then if you want to try Facebook, it's just Roderick Sewell Jackson. All right. Well, I know people are going to be wanting to follow you and we can't wait for that book to come out. What's, what's the timeline? What do you think? Uh, it's going to be a while. It's going to, I, you know, it's still in the process, still in the work. So next year sometime, probably. Next year, the book proposal, maybe. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll be waiting for it. I I know about the process and and how long it takes. So the yeah. best of luck, the best of luck, and I'll be the first one to buy it. I guarantee you that. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. All right, Roderick. Have a great day, buddy. And it's great having you on. And thank you, everybody, again for joining us on Find Your Finish Line, presented by Activice, the official topical pain relief partner of Ironman. If you enjoyed the show, give us a review. You can do it on any of the platforms that you watch the show on, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast. And if you want to see the past shows or this one, go to MikeRiley.net and you can find it there. Thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in. Remember, you're the cause of your own experience. Keep your experiences positive, and it'll get you to your finish line. As always, my warmest aloha.